Okay, guys, today we're going to talk about, I don't know, it's, 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 a, it's a stock that's very popular in the in certain sections of the YouTube investing community. And you guys can kind of guess the types of investors that are into this stock. The stock is, of course, Palantir. We're gonna, that's going to be in the title of the video. It's kind of like the Tesla of 10 years ago. Those type of investors are investing in it. That The people who are really looking for growth, the people who have looked at the founders and said, this founder has the opportunity to grow a massive company. If you look at Peter Thiel, he started PayPal. Oh, he was a co-founder of PayPal, which Elon Musk was as well. And he grew Pay PayPal into a massive company. And uh, Peter Thiel is also a big inv early investor in Facebook, which grew to a massive company, obviously. So people have looked at certain facts with regards to Palantir and thought, maybe this is the next Tesla. So there's a lot of hype around this stock. Lee, do you like the stock? No. The short answer is no, but yeah. obviously we will dig into the reasons why. Um, and also one thing I also want to say to people is this stock is like extreme, well, I find it extremely hard to analyze. Of course. Uh, if I was like, if I'm going to go with anything like the Warren Buffett way of investing, I'm going to say this is like way outside my circle of confidence. And I don't have any, I don't have any insight into like to accurately predict what I think the earnings will be in the future or if they can start generating like positive free cash from the future yeah i love the upfront honesty yeah just no to be honest i, I sort of came to a similar conclusion nevertheless though it, it, is, it is a very interesting stock and in, for what they're doing with the company and even just with regards to what's happening in the world today and how this company is involved so let's just quickly get into what the company is so palantir they get a bunch of information and they sum up all of this information into data points that is relevant to your business so that you can make decisions easily. That's the best way I would sum it up. And we're going to get into some use cases on how this is useful. So one example of how it is useful is with regards to the military. We start with a military operator responsible for monitoring activity within Eastern Europe. They've just received an alert that military equipment is amassed in a field 30 kilometers from friendly forces. AIP leverages large language models to allow operators to quickly ask questions. Show me more details. They ask what enemy units are in the region and leverage AI to build out a likely unit formation. What enemy military unit is in the region? AIP surfaces the option to deploy a nearby drone to collect video. The footage confirms a potential threat. The drone footage shows an enemy T-80 main battle tank. Palantir right now is actually being used in the U Ukraine war. And you can kind of imagine how this is used. So there's all of this information with regards to the war right now. And Palantir gets all of this information and they use AI and their different processing LLMs, language models, to process this and put it in a way that makes it easy for you to understand and to make decisions on that. And I hope that video gives you a bit of a feel for how it kind of works with regards to the military sense. But you can also kind of envision how this works with regards to business as well. Let's say that all this information comes out that your competitor is starting to build new restaurants in your area. And Palantir will show you this. And then you can make certain decisions. Oh, what do you want to do? Do you want to build restaurants in the same location? Da, 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 and make decisions around that. The one thing I, I got from reading their 10K, which I, re I was reading um, before, 60% uh, of their revenue is from the government the government, and 40% is from like normal consumers. And it does look like the just normal consumers one is growing slightly faster, but still, yeah, 60% six, from the government. It, and yeah, the problem, the problem with like rev revenues like that from the government, it's really hard to tell like, if those revenues can keep growing in the future or like how they're going to keep growing in the future. Cause I, it like largely depends on like, is the U S going to get into wars? Are they going to keep spending more money on their military? So it's, yeah, that, that's one thing I found. It's like hard to analyze, but they're not just dealing with the USA. They're already uh, in business with England as well. They, they have a, they had or have a contract with the NHS national health service in England dealing, which they used to deal with the pandemic to analyze the operation of the vaccination program. So how many vaccines were put out, who hasn't got a vaccine. So they're not just with the USA government, but they're also with England and other governments around the world. But you're right, it is hard to know exactly 
how they can keep growing this and will the government spend more on them? One thing I also noticed when I uh, read the 10K statement is because it's a lot of military stuff and like potentially like CIA stuff that they're doing, I don't actually think they're allowed to talk about a lot of it in their 10K right. yeah, or even yeah. disclose a lot of this information to their investors, which yeah. like as investors, that's really not good for us. It's like, as an investor, I, I, I want to really know my company well, like if I'm buying shares in it, I want to know like, like how they make their revenue. I want to understand yeah. their business model well. But for this, it's like you read through the 10K and it's like, it gives you the very basic like financial like metrics, but there's not really like much yeah. digging into like, this is how we're making this money, which for me, it, it, I mean, for me already, that would be too much uh, for me to invest in a company if I see that. Because if they're not giving you the full information of how they're making the money, then it's very hard to assess the true value of what they're worth. They're kind of like, yeah, we kind of got this contract with this government here and, but you can't really assess, can, can we keep growing with the contract? Can we get more contracts? How much revenue are, are we going to get from these contracts? If they're not sharing all of the information, it is hard to know as an investor, okay, well, how much is this company actually worth? And uh, Facebook did the same thing, Meta. Now, they originally, they shared like the individual user data for like WhatsApp and Instagram and Facebook. And then they just stopped sharing this data. And that really annoyed me because it's important mm -hmm. information to know as an investor and they just stopped sharing it. That's the that's the really cool thing. Um, Warren Buffett says like in his Berkshire 10K statements, the way he he like, tries to do those statements is he's like, I would, I'm going to give you all the information that I would need myself if I was an investor to know if it's a, like to know how to value the company. And that like, that's an awesome way to do the 10 K statements, which a lot of companies, as you say, don't do. Yeah. But Warren, but that's, how really it should that. be. that's how it should be because the managers of the business are managing the shareholders business where the, as a shareholder, we're the owners of the business. Tell us the information that we, we need to know, but we live in, in an environment these days where the managers have so much power and the, the shareholders are not uh, giving them accountability because so many of the shareholders own the shares through index funds. They don't even know what the heck they own. So the managers just have so much power and they're like, no, nah, we're going to do this. We don't care about you. And it annoys me. And this is actually a really worry because a real worry because the percentage of uh, shares that are owned in index funds is going up and up and up. Yeah. Like uh, people realize that index funds is, is, are a great way to invest and they are a great way to invest now. But the problem is when like too many people get into index funds, it's like everyone owns these shares, but no one actually, none of the owners are actually like following how the shares yeah. are controlled. And that's when you start to get like worrying discrepancies between how the company is run. Yeah, like run by the managers versus how the owners would want it to be run. Yeah, and this actually leads to very bad implications in the world because it's unearned power. It's like giving uh, your son all of this money and he hasn't earned any of it and then he just goes and spends it on stupid stuff and or it's like the kings just giving all their power to their son and the son ends up going crazy. You're just giving these managers unearned power, all of this money to manage and they end up making all of these crazy decisions. And I don't want to get too political or anything, but we saw it with Twitter and how they da -da 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 a few years ago. And we're seeing it with certain companies banning certain people. And it's because of this unearned power and shareholders are not making the managers or the employees of their company accountable. Very annoying. Now, one thing I should point out to anyone who is going to buy this stock, uh, this stock has a a dual voting class share structure similar to the way that I think Berkshire has and Google has uh, whereby like there's different class shares and some shares which I think in Palantir it's called class F which is class F for founders so the founders own like a decent amount or all of these class F shares and these class F shares will be like a similar value in value to because it owns a similar percentage of the business th than the other shares Mm. But these class F shares have, I think it was 10x the voting rights of the other yeah. shares. So that, that's the way that's the way that they structure a lot of businesses these days so that the certain people can have control over the business while other people can have ownership of the business. Mm. So you just need to know that if you're investing that you're not actually going to have that much control over the business. That all goes to the found uh, to the founders fund. I think it's the founders fund anyway. It's like Peter Thiel and like two other people.
who have Absolutely. most of the control. Okay, I, I want to point out something really interesting here. And this this is like a lesson for any value investor out there. And it's it's kind of like a niche lesson, but it's something that like is really good for everyone to learn. And the first, so the first thing you want to do when you do look at a company, you've probably all heard of like the difference between net income and, and free cash flow. And quite often I use them interchangeably. I'm like, oh, you can just use when you're doing your discounted uh, cash flow analysis, you can either use net income or free cash flow. But the first thing you should always do is check if there's any difference between them. So if you look at the net income for Palantir, you can see it's been negative. Like since 2018, it's been negative. Mm -hmm. So basically saying that the company is operating at a loss. They're mm -hmm. spending more money than they're earning. If you look at the cash flow statement and you look at the free cash flow, you can see in 2018, it was a loss. 2019, it was a loss. 2020 is a loss. 2021 and 2022, the free cash flow was positive. So that straight away, that is the thing that should alert you something interesting is going on here. How can a company have positive free cash flow, but be operating at a loss? And as soon as you see that, as soon as you see a difference in free cash flow and a di versus um, net income, you want to dig into that. So I, I've, I've dug into this for us and I want to show you guys. If we go to ticker, uh, we'll look, let's look at the cash flow statement. So we've got here net income. And if you look at a, basically the, the line I want to point out is here, the stock-based comp compensation line. So uh, free cash flow is done as cash from operations minus capital expenditures. And you'll notice the cash from operations is very different to the net income. And the reason for this is because of this huge stock-based compensation expense. So just to explain that, it's like, you can imagine Palantir get a bunch of income and then they have a bunch of expenses, right? They've got to pay their staff. They've got to pay for, I don't know, what whatever software they're using, whatever service they're using. And for most companies, they will just pay out their staff and all these things in cash. Palantir is doing something different. What they're doing is a big portion of those expenses is instead of paying their employees in straight cash, they're paying them in stock. They just issue more shares and give them to the employees, which as an owner, you want to watch out for that. You're like, hey, I'm buying a piece of this business and you guys are like devaluing or diluting my piece in this business by just printing printing more pieces of this business and giving it away. So as an owner, you want to watch out for that. And that that is uh, represented in that difference between uh, free cash flow and net income. So would you say it, it's more relevant to look at income then? Because that's a real expense, stock-based compensation, and it's not included under cash flow. So it's probably more relevant for us to look at the net income than the, the cash flow statement, because that is a real expense. Yeah, 100% yeah. right. Exactly right. So it's That's like in cash flow. Yeah, 100% right. In cash flow, they're actually positive, right? Like they've got more cash coming into the business than coming out. That's good, right? It like seems good on paper. They've got $183 million more flowing into the business than flowing out. But as yeah. Tristan just said, that $183 million is ignoring the fact that they've issued $564 million in extra shares. If we look at the the net income, I think it's just just got into the the positives, right? Recently, I mean, if oh, we yeah. look as per the quarterly statements, the the annual ones, it's been negative, negative, negative for so long, burning through income, burning through profit. But recently, they have just got into the the positives, and for all of the Palantir bills, they're loving this. They're talking it up big time. You see that? Yeah, those little two marks there, starting to yeah. get into the positive profit. So even with even if you include those stock based compensation, still they've just started to to become profitable. How do we value this? Very hard to value. Um, uh, so we'll look look here at total revenues. I mean, I, I, I'm going to go off the yearly statements, and most of them have been negative. So it's it's really hard to tell like what the potential profit margin for this company could be. And honestly, I don't really know what the potential profit margin for this company could be. What I did in my intrinsic value analysis is I just tried a few different ones to see like uh, how that changes the stock valuation. Why is the profit margin important? Obviously, because uh, because they've been earning negative net income, we need to say like, hey, what percentage of their revenues could they potentially keep? 
Like what, what is the potential profitability, profitability of this business? That's the first thing. And then the second thing we need to work out is what's the growth rate into the future. So you can see the past growth rates, 47%. 41% down to 23%. So the growth rate has been dropping recently over the last few years. I think, I think and I think the reason why is maybe kind of obvious. I mean, in 2020, you can imagine why it grew a lot. They probably got a lot of big contracts with governments. And then 2021, 2022, things started to slow down. The economy started to slow down. So you can kind of imagine why the growth might have slowed down as well. I actually have no special insights. I don't know better than anyone else what their growth is going to be in the future. Yeah. Um, in my intrinsic value analysis, I went with 20. But yeah. I mean, Tristan, do you think that's good? Or, or did you no. have any no. insight to it? No. Yeah. So like for anyone watching at home, like you can, your future get growth rate guess is as good as mine. I'm going with 20 because I'm going on the low end. I want it to be like a little bit conservative if I'm investing in the business. So I say, let's assume they grow at 20% growth rate in the future. Uh, what's the, what starting cash flow should I use? Well, again, I don't know. And that's what I was saying before. Like, maybe we can just have a guess and say like, um, what if they keep their, um, pro profitability at like 10%, this, yep. they, so they would get like $190 million of that revenue, exactly. basically. Exactly. So I'm just going to round that up to 200 to make things easy. So they could keep 200 million of that terminal PE again, it's, this is such a hard company to analyze. I don't know, but I'm going to go with 25 just because that's like kind of standard for the, the broad brush average of the market. So even if I run that, whoa, look at that. You can see 75% below current market cap, i.e. it's worth a lot less than it's currently selling for. Then you ask a question, you can ask a question like, okay, well, maybe what I did was I, I didn't give them enough credit. Maybe they could run this business more profitably because they're mostly software, blah, blah, blah. So let's say, what if they had 20%, if they kept 20% of their revenue? Okay, 400. Still 50% below current. It's still valued, currently valued at double the price that it's worth. So this is why I mean, it's good to it just just play around with the intrinsic value calculator, just so you can get a feel for the different outcomes and if they grow by this much how much could the value be worth if the company makes really good decisions and they grow at a really high growth growth rate and really high profit margins then this is how much it might be worth if they make bad decisions and then competitors come then this is how much it might be worth it's good to just play around with this intrinsic value calculator because it's going to give you a better idea of what the intrinsic value actually is yeah exactly and it's so it's i think it's really handy being able to just change a number very quickly and click calculate and you see the calculation yeah. pop up is it much quicker than doing it in Excel? But like, so even, the cool thing now is even though this company is really hard to analyze, we do know, like we've done some stuff here where we've given like the pretty optimistic, pretty optimistic projections in the future. And even with these pretty optimistic projections, it still looks like uh, the company's too expensive. Even the market's still trying to figure out what to pay for this company. I mean, just last year or two years ago, it was at double the valuation. So you might think, oh, these valuations, they're so different from one another, but the market is still trying to figure out actually what is the true value. I think last year or two years mm -hmm. ago, this company was a $70 billion company and now it's a $35 billion one. So the market itself is telling you, actually, I don't even know how much I want to pay for this, this company. Uh, you know, right now it's at 17 times revenue, not even profit, 17 times sales of the business. It tells you that what I was saying at the very start of the video, there's a lot of hype around this company. That's why people are willing to pay 17 times the, just the revenue of the business, not even the profit. And two years ago, well, last year, I can't remember, but it was 60 times revenue. Two years ago, they were uh, even more bullish on this company. And now that bullishness has gone down a bit. So the market's still trying to figure out, is this a $35 billion company? Is this a 70 billion? Who knows? It could be a $1 billion company. I'd hate to hate to say that to all the Palantir bills out there, but we've seen it with so stock after stock after stock that was once worth $10 billion, $20 billion two years ago, and now they've gone down by 90%. I, I'll put numerous examples of that in the video overlay. It's a very speculatory stock in the fact that it doesn't have years and years of profit to go back on. You can't say, oh, okay, last year it made this much profit. How much am I willing to pay for that profit? Uh, and the the, the pro high price to sales uh, ratio is another example. It's very speculatory. However, I'm not I'm not even saying don't invest in the stock. I'm just saying 
okay, I'm going to do the old Warren Buffett tactic and put it in the too hard basket. I don't know. I When I buy a stock, I want to be 100% sure. I know this company very well. It's got extremely high upside and limited downside. I don't see that limited downside with Palantir. And however, I will give the other point of view. You know, Tesla was like this not too long ago, maybe five, six years ago. They weren't even a profitable company. And <clears throat> I don't know, however long ago it was four years when they reached the the profitable margin and they grew into a massive company. They reached the $1 trillion mark. I think they're below that mark now. And so the, the Palantir do have potential. I'm not saying that, that they won't be a hundred billion dollar company, a 500 billion. I'm not, I can't say for sure. And I want to be able to say for sure before I buy stock and people have doubted this, this company before there's no denying that 20 years ago, uh, they could, they could only get $2 million in early investments. Uh, from outside sources, apart from Peter Thiel, who invested, I think, 30 million. He was the one who believed in the company. So back in the day, no one believed in the stock and look where they are now. They've got uh, they, they've got a $35 billion market cap and they've got $2 trillion in, no, $2 billion in equity. So, you know, people have doubted them before and they've, po they've proved people wrong time and time again. But for me, it's it's uh, it's the same as what Lee was saying with his his intrinsic value calculation. It's so hard to put one. I when I did, I said I'm not even going to try put an intrinsic value calculation on the stock because there's just so many variables at play. I mean, if they get some big big government contracts, imagine getting some big contracts from the United States government or the the uh, the British government, or even getting some big contracts with some private companies like like Microsoft, some of those trillion dollar companies or Apple or whatever. You know, they could be a $100 billion stock if they play the game right. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how well they do. I would be a whole lot more interested in the stock if they were selling at one-time sales, maybe two-time sales, but 17-time sales only just reach profitability. It's just too expensive for me. It's too hard to put a valuation on. I, 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 just looking at the current market right now, I'd rather buy a business like Wise formerly known as TransferWise, which is selling at seven times price to sales ratio, as opposed to, you know, this company here that does have a lot of hype around it, a lot of those type of investors who are willing to pay a high price. And I like to pay a low price for this type of business. One thing I'll say before we go is just always remember the old Warren Buffett uh, analogy of just like, you're playing baseball, you've got unlimited pitches. Yep. If you've got unlimited pitches, you just want to just want to wait till you get that perfect sweet spot. And before you invest in any, any company, just think, is this the perfect sweet spot? True. Which you for can, me, this kind of went to up to value to be yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. That you can just leave uh, pitch after pitch. I don't play baseball, but you can just leave it. You don't have to swing at them. And uh, there's no there's no strikes in investing. You can just leave 100, 1,000, 10,000 and just wait for that one company. You only need one company to get rich. So unless you're 100% very, very certain on this company, then just, just play the game a bit carefully.